Hey you guys, and welcome back to Blickers of Fear, going back to the 1970s for this one. All right, so the 1979 movie, The Driller Killer, probably as well known as it is today, uh, due to the fact that it was one of the most often brought up uh, movies that was on the UK's infamous Video Nasties list. And in fact, um, according to a guy named Mike Bohr, who at the time of this whole brouhaha was the principal examiner at the BBFC, you know, the British Board of Film Classification, uh, this movie, which was directed by Abel Ferreira, and is kind of like a gritty psychodrama, I guess you would call it, uh, his quote was, this movie was almost single-handedly responsible for the Video Recordings Act of 1984. Look up Video Nasties if you don't know what I'm talking about. Now, ironically, um, or not, you know, considering the ridiculousness of the reasons that a lot of films got singled out and put on this stupid list, um, the whole kind of, you know, conflict and controversy about the Driller Killer, I feel like it wasn't so much due to the content of the movie, which was kind of like graphic in places, sure, but it was a lot less violent or gory than a lot of other movies that were coming out during the era. I kind of feel like, um, you know, there was some sexuality in there that maybe people, like, objected to as well, uh, which, you know, I'll bring up later on, but I kind of feel like the main thing that sort of put a target on this movie's back, metaphorically, was pretty much entirely due to its VHS cover. So the movie got a theatrical release in the United States in 1979 with no issues at all. But when it was later released uh, to home video in the UK, which I think wasn't until 1982, uh, its distributor took out like full page ads in trade magazines um, and they showed like the very, very lurid cover art, which is, you know, famous nowadays, which kind of like showed a drill bit like going right into like a screaming dude's head and there's like blood and everything like that. So, um, you know, all the, like, Mary Whitehouse and all those little conservative crybabies were outraged, you know, citing the declining morals of the nation, blah de blah And uh, the Driller Killer ended up getting slapped onto the Section 1, the prosecuted nasties list. Now, from the title and the marketing of this, you would think that the Driller Killer was a straight-up slasher film. I mean, that's what it looks like, that's what it sounds like, but it's actually a lot more interesting than that. What I mean by that is uh, the movie actually does have a few hallmarks of slasher movies. Like a guy does go around killing homeless people with a power tool at one point. But honestly, it's more of a kind of, I don't even want to say slice of life, but it's kind of more of like a psychological type of horror movie and kind of like a descent into madness piece, I guess. And actually, I'd even argue that it's probably best viewed as, like I said, almost like a time capsule of late 1970s New York, like when the city was just like filthy and rat infested and just kind of like constantly haunted by drunks and drug addicts and the mentally ill who had, um, you know, shortly before had been kind of released back into the streets because of, you know, budget cuts and whatnot. And it's kind of like there was, there was just this sense that everyone was kind of desperately teetering on the edge of ruin and kind of spent whatever meager money they could scrape up on just escape in any form that they could find it, whether that was alcohol or whether it was drugs or hanging out in grungy punk clubs or whatever it was. So Driller Killer was actually Abel Ferreira's first feature-length non-pornographic movie. Uh, prior to this, he'd made several short films and a porno with the delightful title of Nine Lives of a Wet Pussy, um, which actually sounds like a lot of fun. I'd have to like look that up. Now, Driller Killer, it's definitely low budget. It was made for about a hundred grand, I believe. And it kind of shows in places, but I think like a lot of the trademarks that Abel Ferreira would become known for during his you know subsequent career, which is very long and kind of still ongoing, um, they're already pretty evident, like even in these early days. Like there's a lot of this very pervasive Catholic imagery and like Catholic themes like redemption things like that um, and also his fascination with artists and their relationship to their art 
Uh, Abel Ferreira actually are, um, stars in this one as well, like in the lead role under a pseudonym, Jimmy Lane. So our protagonist, uh, played by Abel Ferreira, is Reno Miller. And he's kind of like a struggling, starving artist guy living in a kind of like grimy apartment. Although it's like not that bad a size, like for a Manhattan apartment now that I'm looking at him, like... I could live there, <laughs> you know what I mean? It is kind of grimy, but it's not that bad. Um, but it's in Union Square in Manhattan. Now, he appears, and this is kind of what I was referring to earlier about how some people might have, like, objected to the sexuality portrayed in this. He appears to be in some kind of, like, polyamorous triad. They never call it that. It's not really defined. But nowadays, if you saw it, that's probably what you would call it. So it's him, and it's his girlfriend, Carol, who's played by Carol Mars, who looks eerily like a proto Catherine Zeta Jones. I was like, is that Catherine Zeta Jones? She looks a lot like her. Um, so she's actually recently divorced her husband and is kind of like, you know, spreading her wings and trying to be free and doing whatever. And also Carol's girlfriend, Pamela, who's played by Baby Day. She's kind of like a spacey, like punk rocky kind of like party girl. So the three of them are living in this apartment and they're living like a lot of people did in New York back then, like very, very much hand to mouth. Like Reno does seem to have sold some of his art in the past, like judging, at least from his interactions with Dalton Briggs, who's the art dealer that he associates with. And Carol actually gets an alimony check from her ex-husband. Uh, it's not real clear how Pamela makes any money, uh, if she does. But the trio are a couple months behind on their rent. And they also just received this like big, huge phone bill that they can't afford to pay, uh, mostly because Carol and Pam have been making like a bunch of long distance calls. Now, the piece that Reno is currently working on, though, uh, is supposedly it's going to change everything for them, or at least kind of that's what he's convinced himself and he's convinced them of it, too. So it's a painting and it's like a big huge depiction of what looks like kind of like a frightened buffalo and it's overlaid with these sort of like ragged red claw marks it's kind of a cool painting actually um and even though like from our point of view it looks finished um reno being like an artiste and whatnot he kind of like refuses to take it to the dealer or refuses to have the dealer come see it until he's completely satisfied with it even though you know they're all like hurting for money right now and it would like be really helpful if he could sell it um reno actually though even goes to dalton's office and asks for an advance on the painting even though the dealer hasn't even seen it yet um but dalton says no uh, because he says he's already given reno like several advances one of which was for his girlfriend's abortion so he's like yeah not giving you any more money bud so you know obviously all of these financial stresses are really kind of taking a toll on everyone um you know they're often stuck in the apartment watching tv because they can't afford to go out and do anything now one evening in kind of like a little significant thing that happens uh reno sees this commercial on tv for something that's called a porto pack um and it's kind of like this belt like battery pack for using power tools on the go like before you know now nowadays it's like you know it's just like a battery and blah 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 but back then you had to have this big belt with batteries on it uh and he kind of becomes like entranced with that he's like "Ooh, you can use power tools like while you're walking around that's really neat and there's another kind of significant thing that happens is he's kind of up on the roof like watching the streets or whatever and he's kind of simultaneously horrified but also sort of fascinated by this incident that he witnesses in the street one day where a dude like across the street from his building is just randomly stabbed and like left for dead in the middle of a busy sidewalk like in broad daylight so as if the pressure of being broke and kind of just living on the margins of society and living kind of in the shitty neighborhood wasn't enough reno's um artistic concentration is disrupted when a no wave band called the roosters who are actually friends of pamela's and she's the one that recommends them for this building they move into the building and i don't know if it's upstairs from their apartment or downstairs i'm not really sure um so they move in and they basically start rehearsing like day and night they must be like totally coked up because <laughs> They're saying, like, they just never stop. They're constantly, constantly playing over and over and over. And there's a lot of footage of them rehearsing in their apartment. So, you know, but I'll get in a little bit more into that later. So Reno starts getting increasingly agitated by this constant noise. Like, he can't concentrate on his painting. And, you know, subsequently, his relationship with Carol begins to deteriorate. And he starts, like, snapping at her and saying all kind of horrible things, which apparently he didn't do before. 
So he goes to complain to the landlord about the band, uh, but the landlord is like, meh, not my problem. It says the music doesn't bother me and you don't really have any right to bitch because you are a couple months behind on your rent anyway. So you're essentially like living here for free. Um, but then like in a gesture of goodwill, he says, okay, well, I'll say something to them. I'll say that somebody called the police or something. I won't say it's you. And then also somewhat randomly, um, he offers Reno a skinned rabbit to eat. Like he had had a rabbit in his office before that you assumed was a pet, but I guess he killed it and skinned it like for food. And I think the fact of him giving them the rabbit, I could be totally wrong about this, but I don't think I am. I think it was perhaps a nod to Repulsion, the Roman Polanski movie, 1965, because that also had to do with a person like isolated in an apartment who's like going batshit crazy and kind of becomes fixated on a skinned rabbit that she's going to eat for dinner. So I'm pretty sure that that wasn't a coincidence. I think that's a deliberate reference. So later on, Reno starts cutting up the rabbit to cook and he just ends up kind of flipping out and mutilating it instead in like a pretty gross scene actually, because I think that actually is a real like rabbit carcass. And I should note, too, that at around this time, there are, like, definite hints now that he's probably, well, not probably, he's definitely, like, losing his mind. Like, he keeps having nightmares and, like, flashes of himself, like, covered in blood, and he starts hearing Carol's voice when she isn't there. And he starts to see kind of freaky shit. Like he sees Carol with her eyes plucked out and like somebody in a big bunny head, like ducking into the bedroom, like just weird shit like that. And he's also kind of started to fixate on the homeless people that are always kind of like hovering around the building. Like at first he was just going out and sketching them. And it's implied that he had, that he did that a lot because they kind of like knew who he was, you know what I mean? But as the movie goes on, he kind of starts, you know, getting like acting more like aggravated toward them and like ranting at them, you know, about one thing and another. Now, because of a scene at the very, very beginning of the movie, um, where Reno actually gets summoned to a church in his neighborhood because this transient man was brought in who had a piece of paper that had Reno's name and phone number on it. And he, Reno goes to see who it is because they're like, well, we thought maybe like he was a relative or something. And he goes over there and the dude touches him and he's like repulsed and like freaks out and everything. So we're kind of led, this isn't stated explicitly, but we're led to believe that Reno has like almost like an intense fear like shading over into hatred of like homeless people um perhaps because the man in the church was actually his father although he denied it and also because reno is probably terrified that he could very easily end up just like him or just like one of the other you know drifters and transients and homeless people that are kind of like you know hanging around in his neighborhood so finally this kind of swirl of anxieties comes to a head and reno grabs his drill and his trusty proto pack and starts prowling the streets of Manhattan, pretty much like murdering homeless men willy-nilly and just like big bloody fountains of carnage. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> like way more blood than, in, than one person has in there. But you know, I'll get into that in a second too. Now his crimes are actually like reported in the papers because obviously like go, somebody going around killing homeless men with a drill, I mean, that's newsworthy, sure. But uh, nobody really suspects that he's the one responsible. So after he's actually killed several people, like in horrible ways, he actually declares that his painting is now finished and he asks Dalton, the art dealer, to come have a look at it and like make an offer. So Dalton comes over and he completely eviscerates it. He's just like, this is completely worthless. Like, what the fuck are you even doing? Like, you got me over here for this is a waste of my time. I'm not buying it. And basically just like storms out of the apartment. Now, because Reno just kind of sits there blankly as basically all him and his, you know, two girlfriends' dreams of riches just go up in smoke, uh, Carol, his, you know, one girlfriend, like, just blows her stack. Like, first she starts screaming after Dalton, like, as he's leaving, but then she kind of, like, focuses a lot of her rage on Reno for basically just, like, sitting there like a douche and not, like, standing up for himself. Um, and she's fed up, so she finally leaves and ends up going back to her ex-husband. And that appears to be kind of like the final nail in the coffin of Reno's sanity. Now, Reno actually does end up killing Dalton, like for dissing his buffalo painting, but it's actually, the movie actually leaves unclear whether he killed Pamela or Carol. 
um, which I found kind of an interesting decision. I mean, I feel like it does kind of follow more in line with Reno's pathology, like as laid out in the film, because it wasn't so much the women in his life that he was angry at, uh, but the men in his life that he was angry at. Like I said, it's kind of like almost misplaced rage like toward his father. Um, you know, particularly the old bums in the street who were kind of like an ever-present reminder, like I said, not only of his own father, who it's implied was also a transient like that, but of, it's like, you know, you don't sell a painting, like, you're gonna end up just like that because you're not gonna have any money, and that was, like, his worst fear, apparently. So, as I mentioned, like, The Driller Killer, it's not exactly a slasher film. So don't go into it expecting that. Yes, I know like the title sounds like a slasher film and yes, I know the cover looks like a slasher film and it does have slasher film kind of aspects to it toward the end, but don't, if you go into it just expecting a traditional slasher film, you're gonna have a bad time because it's not like that. Abel Ferreira, in fact, has often referred to it as a black comedy, which I guess it sort of is, and that's kind of like going back to what I said earlier about when he goes around and starts drilling all the homeless men, um, you know, they have like way more blood than, I mean, they're, the, the murder scenes aren't funny, but they're kind of like over the top in a very, very subtle kind of way, which is like with all these fountains of blood and stuff. And I think that that's what he means kind of when he says that it's kind of like a black comedy. I kind of get what he's saying. But if it is a black comedy, it's a very grim, very downbeat uh, <laughs> black comedy for sure. Uh, this movie is like really grubby. It has some amateurish aspects, although not as many as you might think, like, um, you know, given the budget and the time that it was made. Actually, a lot of the acting is quite good. And um, a lot of the scenes, as far as I could determine, were improvised. Uh, you know what I mean? That They didn't have, like, they had a script and, like, shit like that. But basically, they just said, well, this is the situation. Like, make something up. So there is, like, an impro improvisational tone to it, which actually, like, lends to a little bit of the naturalism to it. But, yeah, there is a real solid story in here and kind of... I guess like a slightly deeper thematic resonance than your usual like cheapy exploitation flick that came out around this period. Cause like, I think this gets lumped in with those kind of movies and it's not really like that. There's definitely like something more going on in this one. Now I do admit that the movie gets a bit rambling in places. Like it tends to meander. Uh, you do get the sense that Abel Ferreira like just shot a a bunch of footage of like his friends and like actors just improvising things or just acting like their usual selves. Um, so I'm gonna say if you don't have much patience for like hanging around in scuzzy apartments and even scuzzier punk clubs with a bunch of kind of like late 70s, no wave, New York City, druggies, artists, musicians, like that kind of thing, then you might find yourself like kind of bored or like kind of annoyed and wondering, hey, when the hell is all the drilling gonna happen? Now, I actually always really was into this era and this whole art and music scene. Like I'm really into like a lot of no wave stuff, especially like Swans and, you know, uh, Lydia Lunch and stuff like that. And this is kind of like that sort of thing, like when New York was like a shithole and there was just all this kind of, you know, just like punk and avant-garde like art and stuff like that going on. So I actually didn't mind all the time that was spent like essentially like immersing the audience into the world of these characters because this is, you know, a scene that I find really interesting. And I'd argue as well that kind of just watching these people go about their lives in you know, these kind of shitty, what was then like the mean streets of New York City when everyone was poor, it really kind of like amply conveyed just the poverty and the filth and the dirtiness and the hopelessness that was kind of like endemic to the period, like more than any dialogue or anything more out, you know, kind of more um, outright would have done. So, I mean, it's a really dirty, depressing movie for sure. And one, like I said, that maybe meanders around too much for its own good and does leave some plot threads unexplored, like especially like what happened to Pamela. I was kind of wondering about that, but I always found it pretty compelling, like despite all that, um, you know, though of course your mileage may vary. I have seen like some horror fans that really don't care for it. They just think it's too boring or like it takes too long for shit to happen. But you know, and I can see that, like that's a valid criticism, but I don't know. I just find all the characters interesting. I find the time period interesting. So, but I think that um, your enjoyment of the film is really gonna hinge on that. I kind of recommend it, just not across the board, but I'd recommend it to anybody that digs that kind of like seedy 70s, 80s New York City vibe that you see in movies like maybe Maniac or Chud 
or basket case or hell, like even taxi driver or something like that. If you're into that kind of like scuzzy New York City movies, then you'll probably get really into it. Other than that, probably not. And like I said, don't go into it expecting a slasher because it's not really. So that'll do it for this Flickers of Fear. Hope you enjoyed it and I will see you guys again on the next one. Bye.